I'll be brief. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome uh, to today's speaker series. Actually, it's our first speaker series this semester, so it's great to be back. Uh, I am not Michelle De Stefano, but Michelle De Stefano, who would normally be doing the introduction, is somewhere between here and Logan Airport, and she extends her apologies for not being here. But I am the executive director of the Center of the Legal Profession, and today we have a real special father and son treat. We have Richard Suskind, the professor uh, and speaker and independent advisor and author to major professional firms all across the globe and to governments as well. His main area of expertise is the future of professional service and in particular the way in which the IT and internet are changing the work of lawyers and legal practitioners all around the world. He has worked on legal technology for over 30 years. He lectures internationally and has written many books and advised numerous government inquiries. In fact, uh, he's going to talk a little bit of that about, hopefully before you leave today, you'll pick up a card and maybe you'll buy his new book and there's a little summary of it up here. Uh, Richard lectures internationally and has been invited to speak at over 40 countries and has addressed audiences in person and electronically. In fact, I believe it was last year we had Richard's uh, participate in our disruption and innovation conference and he joined us virtually over the internet in Austin Hall, which was wonderful, our most widely attended and watched event uh, since I've been here. He has written and edited numerous books including Expert Systems and Law in 1987, The Future of Law in 1996, Transforming the Law in 2000, uh, The Suscon Interviews, Legal Experts in Changing Times in 2005, the end of lawyers, question mark. Thank God there's a question mark after that. Rethinking the nature of the legal services in 2008. Tomorrow's lawyers, which is much more optimistic, in 2013, and has written around 150 columns for the Times. His work has been translated into 10 languages all around the world. Which I think is an additional special treat is uh, Professor Suskin is, is joined by his son Daniel, which is always nice to see a father and son uh, presentation. And Daniel, in his own right, is a lecturer in economics at the Lloyd College in Oxford, where he teaches and researches uh, from uh, where he is with, uh, has two degrees in economics. Previously, he worked for the British government in the Prime Minister's Strategy Unit in the Policy Unit in 10 Downing Street, another very famous address. Uh, senior Policy Advisor to the Cabinet Officer, and he was a Kennedy Scholar here at Harvard University. We are extremely humbled and delighted that you're both here with us. Welcome to Harvard Law School. Well, thank you very much for that warm introduction. It is a great pleasure to be here with you. This, as has been advertised, is a double act, father and son. Uh, I'll move on immediately. What we intend to do is divide the load. Uh, Daniel will talk about the two futures facing the professions and give you a sense of what's happening at the vanguard. Uh, I'll return and talk about trends that we're seeing right across the professions and speak a little bit about how it is we regard professional services evolving. I'll also speak about technology and artificial intelligence, which will lead Daniel back to talk about the future of employment and jobs. And finally, I'll finish by some thoughts on how it is that we produce and share expertise in society. So over to Daniel to talk about the future. Thanks very much. Lots of people ask how we came to write the book together. What can I say about a co-author who in many ways has become like a father to me? <laughs> so as, as many of you will know and, and have just heard, my dad has been thinking about how technology affects the legal profession for the past so 38 years. Uh, and, and what he's found is that after talking to audiences predominantly of lawyers, occasionally a stray doctor or a stray teacher or a stray architect, a stray professional, would come up at the end of a, a presentation and say, um, that's all very interesting in the legal profession, but what you're talking about applies in our profession too. And we first, uh, we first spoke about this back in 2010 when, when I was working in the policy unit. And I was working on lots of, uh, in lots of different policy areas, on health policy, on education policy, on tax policy, and had a, a good overview of lots of different professions. And it was clear that there was significant change in the air and that the professions appeared to face a common set of challenges. So we had the idea of joining forces uh, and, and the result was this book. 
So we look at eight professions, uh, law, tax and audit, education, healthcare, divinity, we look at journalism, we look at architecture and management consulting. Uh, we held about 100 interviews, both with people in the traditional professions, but also uh, people and in institutions and organizations outside the professions who are trying to do things differently. Uh, drew on hundreds and hundreds of sources, both traditional publications, but also there's a lot of online material in the book as well. And the picture we get is a radical change. And our book is trying to make sense of this change. And very broadly, we see two futures for the professions. And the first we say is reassuringly familiar. It's just a far more efficient version of what we have today. And in this future, professionals use technology, but to streamline and optimize the traditional ways in which they've worked largely since the middle of the 19th century. And, and there's lots of examples of this, this more efficient first future. Doctors talking to patients via Skype, uh, teachers drawing on online materials in the classrooms, architects using computer-assisted design software to design bigger and more complicated buildings. So that's the first future. But there's then a second future, which is a very different proposition. And here, professionals, or here, what we call increasingly capable systems and machines, not only streamline and optimize the traditional way in which professionals work, but they actively take on some of the tasks that we associate with traditional professionals, displacing traditional professionals from that work. For now and in the medium term, we expect these two futures to develop in parallel, but in the long run, we expect that second future to dominate, that we'll find new and better ways of producing and sharing expertise in society, and this will lead in the long run to the gradual dismantling of our traditional professions. And that, that's really where the, our research and, and the latest evidence leads us. But it also led us to ask a more fundamental question, and we open the book with this, which is why do we have the professions at all? And the answer, and again it runs through our work, is that the professions, although they're different, in analogous ways are all, of, all a solution to the same problem, which is that nobody has sufficient specialist knowledge to cope with all the daily challenges in life. You know, no one knows everything. Human beings have what Herbert Hart, uh, Herbert Hart called limited understanding of the world around them. And so we turn to doctors and lawyers and teachers and accountants and consultants because they have the specialist knowledge that we need to get on in life. So in what, in what we call a print-based industrial society, the professions are the way that we solve these daily challenges. Professionals have knowledge, they have skills, they have experience, they have know-how. And our term, collective term to this is they have the practical expertise, the practical expertise to solve those daily challenges that those they help do not. Importantly, they operate under a grand bargain. In return for asking them to provide certain services, in different ways, the professions are granted exclusivity over the provision of services. And each profession is, in, uh, is asked to act as a gatekeeper of their own distinctive body of knowledge. So doctors look after medical knowledge, lawyers look after legal knowledge, accountants look after accounting knowledge, and so on. So that, that's our analysis of the professions in, in this print-based industrial society. But we're no longer in a print-based industrial society. We're in what we describe being a, a technology-based internet society. And those traditional professions that I spoke about before are creaking. They're unaffordable in that most people and most organizations simply don't have access to the expertise of first-rate professionals or indeed of any professionals. Now, they're antiquated. Most professions rely upon tired ways of producing and sharing information and knowledge despite the existence of feasible alternatives. Professions are really opaque and sometimes this is because the work that they do is genuinely too complex <coughs> for lay people to understand, but other times there's intentional obfuscation as well. And finally, they underperform. Given the way that we organize expertise in society, the expertise at the very best can only be enjoyed by a privileged and lucky few. At the finest expertise in society is a very, very scarce resource. And so we ask this question, as we move from this print-based society to an internet society, might there be entirely new ways of organizing professional work? Might there be some ways of making this practical expertise that I spoke about before available on an online basis, do we still need those traditional gatekeepers? And so, 
as, as part of the project in the book, we, we spent some time at the vanguard with the people and the organizations who were trying to solve the sorts of problems that the professions have traditionally solved, but are doing it in, in different ways. And, and in the book, there are hundreds of case studies. Uh, and now I just want to give you a flavor and take you on a, a whirlwind tour of them. So in education here, Harvard, more people signed up for your online courses in a single year than had attended this institution in its entire existence up until that point. Khan Academy, online collection of instructional videos and practice problems, again in education. I'm sure lots of you are familiar with it. Uh, I, it's, it's really high quality stuff. I use it to teach my students maths and economics at Oxford. Uh, it, has, it has 10 million unique users a month. In a way, that's a higher effective attendance than the entire school population of England. WebMD, online collection of uh, health websites with extensive uh, guidance on uh, treatments and, and symptoms, it has 190 million unique users a month. So that's more than to all the traditional doctors working in the US. Uh, the US Food and Drug Agency has said that by 2018, there will be 1.5 billion people with at least one medical app on their smartphone. In journalism, on its sixth birthday, the Huffington Post had more unique visitors than the New York Times. It's 164 years old. Uh, Bleacher Report, a blog <coughs> written by 2,000 sports fans, it now has 22 million unique users a month. So that's, uh, that's enough to rival CNN Sports. Uh, again, in journalism, Associated Press, it was in 2014, they started to use algorithms to computerize <coughs> the production of earnings reports. Uh, it was able to produce 15 times as many earnings reports using these algorithms as it could when it relied upon traditional financial journalists. In the legal world, on eBay every year, 60 million disputes arise, and they're resolved online without traditional lawyers using what's called an e-mediation system. Now, bear in mind that 60 million disputes, okay, go back to Britain, that's 40 times as many civil claims as are filed in the entire English and Welsh justice system on this one website in one year. Again, in the legal, uh, legal world, the best known legal brand here is said not to be one of the big traditional law firms, it's LegalZoom.com, online provider of uh, legal <coughs> advice and, and document drafting software. In the world of tax, 2014, 48 million Americans used online tax preparation software rather than a traditional tax accountant to help them. Back in the UK, HMRC has a fraud detection system. It's, it's called Connect. And it sifts through a billion pieces of data in order to detect fraud. And that's no mean feat, given the fact that... Uh, well, it's, so it's, it's said uh, that, that billion, uh, those billion pieces of data, that's more data than is held in the British Library. Uh, and that is no mean feat, uh, given the fact that the British Library has a copy of every single book that's ever been published in the UK. Uh, in the world of architecture, Gramazia and Collar in 2012 used a swarm of autonomous flying robots to build this structure out of 1,500 bricks. Now, again, in the world of architecture, uh, a Dutch firm a few years ago, DUS Architects, started to, to print and assemble a building made entirely of printed parts. It's got a printer that can print objects that are three and a half meters, three and a half meters tall. <coughs> In the world of consulting, Accenture, a consulting firm no longer just employs consultants, it has 750 hospital nurses on its staff. And Deloitte, which was founded as an audit practice over 170 years ago, it now has 200,000 professionals. It's got its own full-scale university set in a 700,000 square foot campus in Texas. Uh, in the world of divinity, uh, in, in Second Life, the, the virtual world, which I'm sure lots of you are familiar with, where people build and control their own uh, avatars, their own virtual characters, uh, there's a virtual island called Epiphany. And, and on this virtual island called Epiphany, uh, a thriving group of Christians run this, admittedly, it's a slightly gloomy looking, uh, Anglican Cathedral. Um, so this Anglican Cathedral runs daily worship services. It has weekly Bible study classes. And for those who want it, it has counseling services as well. And finally, in 2011, <laughs> the Vatican uh, issued the first digital imprimatur 
And an imprimatur is the, the license that the Vatican gives to a religious text to grant the authenticity. <coughs> um, it granted the first ever digital imprimatur to this app called Confession. Uh, now, this app helps you prepare for confession. It's got tools for tracking sin, uh, and it's got, it's got drop-down panels of options for contrition. <laughs> and uh, it was very controversial in 2011 because the, the issuing of imprimators in the Catholic Church is decentralized, so individual churches can issue them. And a church somewhere in America, I can't remember where, issued this imprimator for this app, and it caused such excitement that the Vatican, the central body of the Vatican, had to step forward and say, it's okay to use this app, uh, but only use it to prepare for confession. You know, it's no substitute for the real thing. Um, so that, that's a whirlwind tour of the sorts of things that we uh, document in the book and are trying to understand. I have hand back now to my dad to, to look at the, the trends. So when we looked across the professions, we found eight broad patterns that it seemed to us applied there and underneath these we saw 30 trends. We're not going to go into each in detail today. Just to give a flavour, fundamental to each profession we see is a move away from what we call bespoke service, the idea of a highly customised, tailored service, unique from one individual to another. Uh, we're seeing what for years I've been calling decomposition, the breaking down of professional work into component parts and the identification of the most efficient way of doing these component parts. And we're seeing generally a move towards routinization, where it is that the component parts can be routinized, the market in large part is requiring that they should be routinized. Now we express this and various other trends in a model of evolution of legal and professional services. So we start <coughs> off with the notion that, and this is so familiar to many of us, that the professions in some sense are a craft. But then we see right across the professions a move towards standardization of content of process. And we see even further within the professions of professional organizations a move towards systematization, the use of workflow, the automatic generation of documents and so forth. But then something very important happens. And we see a move from the internal crafting, standardizing, and systematizing of work within the professions towards externalization, towards making legal content professional guidance, advice, and so forth available on an online basis. And we call this externalization. And it happens in three broad ways. It can happen that <coughs> online professional guidance is made available as a chargeable service. So the accounting firms are providing online tax services at a cost. Then there's online services that are delivered on a non-chargeable basis, often by voluntary organizations or by government bodies. And finally, and of most interest to us, where the content, the guidance, the advice, the practical <coughs> expertise, as Dan said, is available <coughs> on a commons basis, as a shared resource, not under controlled by commerce, not under controlled by government or private sector bodies, but in the spirit of open source software, in the spirit of Wikipedia, this content is held <coughs> in a commons. And they're the options that are available to us as we externalize professional knowledge. And we call this move from left to right, in very broad terms, the commoditization of professional service. And it's underpinned by technology. We've come a long way in technology. I always say to all my audiences, in 1996, I wrote a book called The Future of Law. And in that book, unremarkable though it may sound now, one of my major things was that email would be extensively used across the profession. I suggested that the dominant way that lawyers and clients would communicate in the future would be by email. The Law Society in England and Wales at the time said I shouldn't be allowed to speak in public. <laughs> they said I was bringing the profession into disrepute by suggesting that lawyers and clients would use email together. That was 20 years ago. Now what we're seeing, we try in our book to make sense of what's happening in technology. We see technology advancing on all different fronts. We capture the remarkable, unprecedented technological growth that we're seeing in information technology under these four headings. We see an exponential growth in the underpinning technologies. We see our systems becoming increasingly capable. We see also the machines themselves and chips becoming increasingly pervasive. And as human beings, we're becoming increasingly connected. Just to dip into a few of them to give a sense, the exponential growth, of course, we all know Moore's Law, not a law of the land, the law developed by Gordon Moore 51 years ago saying that every two years, approximately, processing power would double. This gives rise to this 
massive explosive growth in processing power. Look at Michael Spence and Bill Preisman are saying in 2001 when speaking essentially about Moore's law. He said roughly a 10 billion times reduction in the cost of processing power came in the first 50 years of the computer age. And remember, every two years, that was a further doubling, 20 billion, 40 billion, and so forth. We're living in unprecedented times, I say. It just so happens we have all been born at a time of greater technological process, progress, more rapid progress than the world has ever seen. Look at Schmidt, Google's chairman, says every two days now we create as much information as we did from the dawn of civilization up until 2003. <coughs> By 2020, that'll be about every two hours. More prosaically, just think of the cars that fit in cameras. 2005, a good car was 128 megabytes. 10 years later, 128 gigabytes, more than a thousand fold increase in less than 10 years. This is not science fiction. We are happy to be living in what is virtually uh, a revolution. And our machines, and this is one of the defining phrases of our book, are becoming increasingly capable. It's not that they're plateauing out. It's not that there's going to be no more apps or machines will never uh, increase in processing power or, or capacity. We're seeing our machines, our systems becoming increasingly capable. We analyze that, I won't dwell today, under four headings. Uh, we're seeing the use of big data as a new technique for massive bodies of data. We're managing to identify regulator. Uh, uh, regularities, parts, patterns, correlations that are allowing us to solve problems in quite different ways from the past. We're seeing problem solving with systems such as IBM's Watson, question and answer systems that can outperform human beings. We're seeing the field of effective computing, more of which in a couple of seconds, and of course in robotics. And let's dip down into effective computing, computers that can both detect and express human emotions. Machines more accurately than human beings can now look at a face and tell whether or not it's happy or surprised, angry or disgusted. Can tell whether or not a smile is fake or genuine. Our machines by our <coughs> handhelds by 2020 will know what kind of mood we're in. You'll get a hug in your coat where someone said something favorable on Facebook. We'll be connected to one another and somehow this won't be dry. There'll be an emotional content. And look at this, Professor Ishiguru, in our view, the world's leading academic robotics who builds androids, humanoids. This is one of himself. Uh, we are, it's really, it's clear, or rather unclear, which is him and which is his humanoid. Or his humanoid goes around the world giving lectures on behalf, his behalf. You can't tell if you're more than a few feet beyond the speaker that it actually is a humanoid. So our world is moving on at a drastic, a remarkable rate. And the question we ask lawyers and we ask professionals generally, do we think somehow professionals will be unaffected by these changes? Do we think we'll just carry on as always we were? Or is it not more likely that we'll see profound change in the profession? We're also, as human beings, becoming increasingly connected. It's not just open social networks like Facebook or LinkedIn. Cermo is one for a closed network for doctors. We can gather together and share experience. For architects, similar systems exist. And then there's another form of social network where recipients of professional service can come on line and talk about their experiences. Patients like me, people who have perhaps are suffering from chronic difficulties or who've received medical services can actually share their experiences, their ideas, their hints for others. This is becoming an entirely new way that we're solving problems. Uh, we're helping one another as the recipients. We're seeing it in religion, we're seeing it in architecture, and we're seeing, as you can see before you, in tax as well. And yet another form of social network in the professions, the idea of crowdsourcing, either where there's a huge task requiring very large numbers of individuals, and you can put that project out and share it amongst a large community, or increasingly where you have a problem, you put it out to some kind of web resource where people compete for the particular piece of work and they bid with good ideas. So the way in which our workforce is being handled, uh, the professional workforce, is changing very rapidly. Now all of this leads, I think, to a conversation that we must have about artificial intelligence. In the 80s, I wrote my doctorate in Oxford in artificial intelligence and law. It's very close to my heart, this. And we now see very clearly, as Daniel and I looked at this, there was a first wave of AI uh, in the 80s. And it was characterized in some ways by a project I was involved with in 1986 to 1988. I finished my doctorate, and we developed this system. Uh, I developed with a, he's now a partner in one case at the time, he was uh, the dean of the law school in Oxford University. Now, I want to apologize for the design there, but I also want to assure you at the time this was extremely cool. This was, <laughs> this was state of the art design. Uh, this is a system we developed that solved a particular sort of legal problem. 
And this, ladies and gentlemen, was in the days where floppy disks genuinely were floppy. This was a, a five, two five and a quarter inch floppy disks that we packaged up with a book we wrote about a project, and it was to help cope with this kind of problem. Here's an extract from a piece of legislation, the Latent Damage Act 1986. Section 2 of this Act shall not apply to an action to which this section applies. This was the first thing Philip showed me when we got to the project. He said this is one of the clearer sections of this piece of legislation. <laughs> See, this unbelievable piece of legislation, a convoluted, incomprehensible body of interrelated rules that no one really understood, and then a whole body of case law underpinning it that was also rather opaque. Philip had written the first book on the subject. He said, why don't we try and model his expertise? So essentially what we did was we built a big decision tree of his knowledge. Uh, in fact, it was a, the kind of decision tree that gave rise to a question and answer system. So this is a question from what you've said so far. It seems that the most likely basis for alleging liability will be tortious negligence. Shall we proceed on that basis? You can see, of course, this was designed for what we call lawyers and legally informed people who lacked detailed technical expertise. This was not for a lay person. So through a yes or a no, you pruned your way, you cut, you navigate your way through a complex decision tree. This is just a fraction of it. Interesting, see the little cluster of nodes at the top? That's the legislation. Uh, the rest of it was case law and then interpretations of the case law. Over two million passed through this system. This system that at the end of the day would tell you in certain kinds of action when your action could no longer be raised because it was time barred. So it belonged to the law of limitation. But it wasn't just a law that this work, work was going on in the 80s. People were doing the same in medical diagnostics, in tax planning, people were working in audit systems and consulting too. And Philip and I met uh, in the anniversary, 25th anniversary of the system to discuss progress and we agreed actually that far less progress had been made because in the 80s these were quite powerful systems and if we projected for over 25 years most of us would have expected this kind of technology to be commonplace but most of you have never seen any systems like this in operation so what happened? Well there were three problems. One, the systems are very costly to develop both in terms of original development and in maintaining them. Secondly, there was little incentive across the professions to develop them. This was a world dominated by hourly billing. Why on earth would you develop a system as ours that reduced legal research time from two hours to two minutes if you were getting paid by the hour and your competitors weren't developing these systems and clients weren't clamoring for them? The market wasn't ready. But more significantly, in some ways, in my view, came the way. And suddenly, the World Wide Web, for those of us working in technology and law, here was an opportunity often in a cheap and cheerful way, but very rapidly, to make legal content, legal guidance, legal interpretation available online. So many people working in the AI and law community, and I was one of them, left that community and started thinking about how the World Wide Web might affect us, how it might provide a new channel for the delivery of legal guidance. The real turning point came in 97, when IBM system Deep Blue beat the world chess champion Gary Kasparov. In the 80s, we thought that wasn't possible. We used to sit around talking, would these systems ever be able to beat a grandmaster chess player? And the answer at the time we felt was no, and fairly emphatically no, for a very important reason. Because at the time, our conception of an expert system, a type of AI system that could solve legal problems at the level of a top expert, the idea at the time was that the way you get computer systems to behave with apparent intelligence was somehow to understand how human beings sorted problems, essentially reduce their reasoning processes to a very complex decision tree, drop it into a system, and make it available to less expert people to use. Now that made sense. The problem was that in many areas of expertise, experts would say, I don't really know how I've come to my decision. An expert doctor, when looking at a skin lesion, for example, will say, from their gut, their experience, from their intuition, whether or not it might be malignant. But there's no rules they can develop to summarize their experience, still less for the grandmaster chess player. Gary Kasparov and others have no idea, it seems, even through deep introspection, how it is they make the strategic leaps, they have the creative insights and so forth. So our view was if you couldn't reduce the expert thinking to some body of rules, you're never going to be able to get a system that could outperform a human expert. What we had banked on, of course, was the exponential explosive growth, growth and processing power. So by the time Kasparov came to play Deep Blue, Deep Blue could look at 330 million moves in one second, where even the best chess players 
would find it hard to juggle more than 100 moves in their head at any one time. So Kasparov was beaten by brute force and large bodies of data. In a sense, he wasn't really playing the same game as the machine, but he was outperformed. And the key point here made by MIT leading authority in AI was this. There are lots of ways of being smart that aren't smart like us. And this gives rise to what we think is a fundamental observation. And we call it the AI fallacy. And it's this. It's the mistaken assumption that the only way to develop systems that perform tasks at the level of experts or higher is to replicate the thinking processes of human specialists. We're now seeing we can actually produce systems that perform at a very high level without in any way mimicking or replicating experts. So take judgment. Many people say to me, well, I'm an expert, I'm a professional. Clients come to me for my judgment. How can a computer system ever exercise judgment? And we say that's the wrong question. The right question is this. To what problem is judgment the solution? Why do we need human experts to exercise judgment. What's the problem here? And the problem, we argue, is one of uncertainty. The, the reason we go to experts is we live in an uncertain world. The facts are uncertain. The, the, the rules, the bodies of knowledge are uncertain. So we call on experts who've been around the block. They've seen many problems and say, in your experience, in this condition of uncertainty, what do you think is the likely outcome? So the question is not, can a computer system exercise judgment? But can a computer system handle uncertainty more effectively than human beings? And when you think about it, if you're trying to, uh, if you're drawing as an expert in a body of past experience, computer systems can now draw on a past experience of 10 million uh, medical conditions. It seems to us, at least entirely plausible, that we're going to see a new wave of systems that can handle uncertainty, far, this kind of uncertainty, far better than human beings. People say then, it's a fascinating question, we like it, intellectually, can machines think? Again, it's not the, really the right question. I mentioned IBM's Watson, the system, as you all know, that appeared in the TV quiz show in 2011 and beat the two best ever human champions. One of our favorite quotations in this context, John Searle, the Berkeley philosopher, who said that Watson doesn't know it won in jeopardy. It's absolutely magical that. It didn't ask its friends down to the pub to celebrate it and say, here's how I felt, but it outperformed the human beings. So what we're seeing as an era of increasingly capable, non-thinking machines. Machines that can outperform us. We call this the second wave of AI, and it's got profound implications for the job market. So I think what, what you've just heard raises two fundamental questions. The first is, people tend to ask two fundamental questions. The first is, will there be any jobs left for professionals? That's the first thing that professionals say when they hear that. And the second is, what is it that humans can do that machines cannot? Those are the two nagging questions that people have after hearing that. I want to look at each of these in turn. So first, will, will there be any jobs left? Well, clearly the answer to this depends upon timing. You know, in the medium run, our expectation is that technology will displace a lot of traditional professional roles, but it will also give rise to a, a whole new set of roles. You know, many of these roles exist today and aren't performed uh, it exists today and aren't performed by traditional professionals at all, uh, and many of them are unfamiliar to traditional professionals. So it just, I'm, not, I'm not going to go into them, but if you look in the middle, knowledge engineers, that's what my dad was doing in the 1980s. He was a knowledge engineer. He was sitting down with an expert and trying to mine the jewels of expertise from this person's head and engineer a system out of this knowledge for lay people to use. So that's the medium run, and, and we think it's... Uh, a world in which technology changes the sorts of roles that people perform. Uh, but people are also very interested in the long run, uh, and I, I want to turn to this now. And broadly, we can make up two schools of thought. It's two schools of thought here. There's the optimists and the pessimists. And the, the optimists say, well, let's start with the pessimists. The pessimists say no. There just simply aren't going to be enough jobs for people in the future. Uh, machines are becoming increasingly capable. They're able to perform uh, more and more types of work, and so clearly there's going to be less work for human beings to do. Now, the optimists in response say, um, so, that, so that's the pessimist story. The optimists in the response say, no, that's just wrong. You know, clearly, not only is there work today that only humans can do, but in the future, new work will arise, work that today we can't even conceive of, uh, and that work will be done by human beings as well. 
It's here, and you may have heard this phrase, that the optimists make a, a technical criticism of the pessimists. They say they're committing the lump of labour fallacy. And the fallacy is that there exists some lump of work to be divided up between people and machines so that if machines are able to perform more and more types of work, then necessarily uh, the work left for human beings to do gets smaller. And they say that's a fallacy, that's wrong. Because as the economy grows, that lump of work gets bigger. So although machines may be doing more, that there's the lump is getting bigger, so there's also work elsewhere for human beings that are displaced, uh, displaced to do. There's also a theme in, in, the, in the, the optimist story that the optimal future is one in which humans and machines work best together, each bringing their own distinctive capability. So who's, who's right in these two schools of thought? Um, one of the difficulties that we have when we talk about the long-run future of work is that we tend to talk about the different jobs that people do, different jobs. So in the professions we talk about doctors, we talk about lawyers, we talk about teachers and accountants and consultants and so on. But the term jobs just isn't entirely illuminating because it encourages us to think of the work that people do in their jobs as a monolithic, indivisible lump of stuff. When actually, if you look under the bonnet of a job, Professionals do lots and lots of different activities, lots and lots of different tasks uh, in their work. <coughs> their work isn't a monolithic, indivisible lump of, of stuff. Just uh, a prosaic example, the sorts of things that a nurse does today are very, very different from the sorts of things that a nurse would have done 25 years ago. And whereas 25 years ago, being a nurse might have involved bedpans and bedside conversation. Today, being a nurse uh, means that you can prescribe certain types of medication uh, and in the UK at least perform minor types of surgery. It's the same job, nurse, but very, very different composite tasks. So why, why does this matter for thinking about the future of work? Well, when we, when we published the book a few months ago, the, the Economist wrote a, a great review of it, and along, along with the review was this, this cartoon of Professor Dr. Robot QC, a robot <laughs> clad with a lawyer's wig and a doctor's stethoscope and an accountant's ledger. And I think there's a sense in a lot of the commentary that we read on the future of work that one day Professor Dr. Robot QC or one of his relatives um, will you know, push a lawyer out of his chair, you know, push a doctor off the desk. You know, the job of the professional would have been entirely displaced by a robot. Uh, now clearly that's not what's happening or will happen. Um, by way of example, let's go to the medical setting. Uh, this is a device that allows, it's a remote monitoring device, so it allows uh, doc uh, doctors to check on their patients without seeing them in, in person. Um, now clearly if a doctor were to use this, uh, the, um, it would change the sort of job that the doctor did. Um, but to say that this has in some sense uh, displaced the doctor from their job would be to wildly overstate the case. Now, as I said, what we want to say is that the job the doctor has done, the, jo the job the doctor is doing has changed. And by thinking about the composite tasks that make up their job, we can do that more coherently. So it may be that uh, the doctor spends less time uh, in in-person checkups with their patients, but she may also spend more time <coughs> reading, the, uh, reading the latest medical research. <coughs> Changing sets of tasks that have been done by a professional. So let's return to the optimists and pessimists now. We can, we can be more precise. The optimists are saying that there will always be a sufficiency of tasks for human professionals to do, whereas the pessimists are saying no. And there just won't be a sufficiency of tasks. Um, so, so what do we think? Um, we think both are right and wrong. So the pessimists are right to recognize that machines are becoming increasingly capable at the tasks that exist. But they're wrong to ignore the fact that there will be new tasks to be done in the future. And the optimists, of course, are right to recognise there will be new tasks to be done in the future, but their mistake is to think that people will necessarily be best placed to perform those tasks. So our conclusion, and we were interested in the book about the long run, is that yes, machines are becoming increasingly capable. Yes, they'll take on more and more of today's tasks. The optimists are right that new tasks will no doubt emerge, but it's likely that machines will take on many of these as well. Uh, and so this leads us to the conclusion that we find it hard to avoid the conclusion that there'll be a steady decline in the need for human professionals in the long run. Um, 
Now, it's important just to stress here, what, we're not saying that there won't be more work, we're not challenging the assumption that there will be more work to be done in the future. But given what we're seeing, we're challenging a different assumption, which is that people, rather than machines, will be best placed to perform these new tasks. Now, in response to this, a lot of people go, but surely, you know, but surely there must be some tasks uh, that machines can never do, even in this very, this very long run scenario. And I think when people say this, and typically when professionals say this, they have what we call a, a Rubik's Cube conception of machine capability. Now, what do I mean by this? On, on the screen, uh, the man on my left, he, over the course of six months at his dining room table, built, built this machine out of Lego in his smartphone that could solve a Rubik's Cube in three and a half seconds. Uh, so that's about a second faster than the leading human Rubik's Cube champion. Um, now, I think often this doesn't surprise people. You know, yes, a Rubik's Cube is manually dexterous, uh, it's complicated, but ultimately it's rules-based, you know, it's logical, it's self-contained, it's what professionals would call a routine <coughs> task. Um, and professionals say they do much more than just perform routine tasks. They perform tasks that require creativity, require empathy, require judgment. You know, these are things <coughs> that machines can never do, even in this long run story. Put another way, human beings in the professions perform non-routine tasks. Um, and it's, it's, genuine, it's generally at this point that this is a collective sigh of relief uh, as professionals point to the point to the sign and say, yes, that's me, I, I perform non-routine tasks. Uh, and, and the response in the book is not so fast. And it's not so fast for two very important reasons. The first relates to what my dad was talking about before about decomposition. That when you break the work that professionals do into its composite tasks, moving away from thinking about work as a monolithic, indivisible lump of stuff, when you break it into its composite tasks, uh, it transpires that a lot of those tasks are actually routine rather than non-routine. You know, not everything that a professional does in their job requires creativity, requires judgment, requires empathy. So that's the first reason to say not so fast. The second reason, though, relates to the AI fallacy that we heard before. It's a mistake to think as well that machines won't be able to perform <laughs> any of these non-routine tasks. The temptation of all of us is to say that because machines can't think, they can't be creative. Because machines can't reason like a human being, they can't exercise judgment. Because they can't feel like a human being, they can't be empathetic. Uh, so that's the temptation. But the mistake is to fail to realize that many machines can already perform these tasks and are, will be able to perform more in the future, not by relying on creativity or judgment or empathy in the way we think of those things when they're done by human beings, but by for, performing those tasks in fundamentally different ways. Now, this can all sound science fictional, and it's a long-run story, but we already see these two things today. We see professional work being broken down in, into its composite tasks. We see that lots of these tasks are routine rather than non-routine. And we also see increasingly machines performing sorts, the sorts of tasks that we traditionally would have thought could not be performed by these machines. Non-routine tasks, but they're being performed in fundamentally different ways. Hand over now to my dad to talk about mm -hmm. expertise. Thank you, Dan. Just as one example of what Daniel was saying, many of you are familiar with the system Lex Machina, which was recently bought by LexisNexis. It's changing over time what it does, but fundamentally, this is a system that can help predict the outcome of patent disputes in the US more accurately than any human being. It knows nothing with the law, but essentially it's predicting court behaviour. It can predict the behaviour of judges, it has a strong sense of the likely success or otherwise of different lawyers involved. And so this is a move away from thinking that the way to help clients is by working as we always have done, by engaging in complex legal reasoning. Most clients, when they have a dispute of mind, want an answer to the question, what's my chances of winning? We as lawyers think the way of answering that is to engage in legal reasoning. There might be different ways. So let me say in conclusion, just a little bit about a shift in perspective we had in writing the book. We started off writing a book that we thought was about the future of the professions. And we ended up writing a book essentially that addressed this question. How do we produce and distribute practical expertise in society? 
How do we produce and distribute practical expertise in society? Historically, the traditional answer to that is through the professions. That's how that particular challenge has been met. But what we're seeing is there's actually at least six alternative models to the production and distribution of expertise in society. Six models that challenge our conventional ways of running the professions. I'll just give you a very quick count of them each and then we'll close and have some questions. The first is the network, the network experts model. We saw the economists referring to this as workers in tech. Still professional workers, but in entirely different kinds of institutions are gathered together and made available in new ways. You'll know of Axiom, essentially a large resource of freelance lawyers who dropped in on a project basis by and large to particular clients, charging about half the cost of traditional law firms. You see in England, well known, one law firm has done the same. It's set up something called Lawyers in Demand. <coughs> This is a, a group of freelance lawyers who are made available to clients, not through a law firm. These are individuals who work for themselves, they're self-employed, but through this channel, they're made available to clients. Then there's the paraprofessional model. If you think of the, the classic thinking about professional expertise, you have the broad-based pyramid, the deeply expert partner usually at the top, with lots of junior people at the bottom. Uh, but one can imagine a model, and this is... Uh, IBM's Watson logo, where actually some of the complex stuff is actually done not by human experts, but actually done by machines. But we retain, perhaps at the bottom, maybe for interpersonal relationships, maybe uh, uh, as a, a provider of empathy that complements the complex service, but it's a new way of working where people who are historically inexpert can work with machines and perform at a far higher level. Then there's the knowledge engineering model, and that's what I was discussing earlier, that's what I was, where what we do is we draw from experts, their expert thinking, try and model it and represent it and put it in computer systems and make it available to others. In law, that's at the heart of the current field of automated document assembly. It's at the heart, for example, of Alan and Overy's leading law firm, uh, in, uh, international law firm based in England, where they're generating 12 million pounds a year from their subscription-based, essentially, online diagnostic systems. Then there's the communities of experience model. This, this really interests me. This is uh, the idea. We don't have yet, yet have this in law, but you could imagine it, for, particularly for self-represented litigants. The idea that when you have a problem, you don't immediately rush to a professional, but you go to an online community where people share their experiences of how it was they sorted out their problems. And remember, for people who can't afford lawyers, this is hugely better than having nothing available at all. Then the embedded knowledge model. Isn't it interesting, when you play solitaire, or patience as it's known with playing cards, you can put a red five under a red six. Don't know why you want to do it, but you can do it. You try to do that in the electronic card game, it's not possible. The rules are embedded in the system. The five is flicked away. And we'll see more and more rules embedded in systems. Here's Daniel and I are playing golf with a little golf buggy. There's a little sign that says, caution children playing, and it appears on the screen in the buggy as well. It wasn't inviting us to slow down. The machine, the system, the buggy itself automatically slowed down. And we'll see that more and more where we embed rules and regulations into our processes, our buildings, our systems, and indeed in our people. And finally, and to some extent, we get slightly frustrated by this. This is the model that people think our entire book's about, but this is the machine-generated model, where you can uh, imagine a future where medical science will be trumped by data science, where huge bodies of legal experience will allow us to make predictions about judicial outcomes more accurately than through legal reasoning, where we harness our legal experience through the use of data. And finally, uh, we mentioned again Watson, where it's entirely clear to us by the late... 20s, it's very likely that for simple everyday legal questions, people won't be sitting down with lawyers. We'll be using a generation of technology, probably two or three generations later, that we're already seen in action today. 2011, uh, Watson did its stuff. If you look, not so much at what they're doing in law, but if you look where they're doing medicine, the level of diagnostic performance, the quality of treatment plans, it's not at all fanciful to think that for most routine everyday legal problems, Within 15 years, it'll be more usual for consumers to sit down with machines to sort out their little difficulties than with human lawyers. So that, ladies and gentlemen, a, a quick canter through uh, our book. I just want to make one closing remark, and that's for the law students amongst you. You can look at this in two ways. You can say this is dreadfully threatening. 
because I came into the law with a, what I would say is a rumple of the Bailey or a John Grisham or a Suits conception, uh, frankly a 20th century conception of legal practice. Uh, and if you went into the law because you wanted to be that kind of lawyer, I think within 10 years you'll be very disappointed. But you should look at it in another way. You're a privileged generation, and it happens once every two or three hundred years. You are coming into a profession that you personally will all change. You will actually be participants in the kinds of changes we're discussing. It's not for my generation, it's for your generation. So if you want to go in and take the baton uh, from the person the year ahead of you and continue practicing law as it always has been, or at least for the last 50 or 100 years, that's fine. But I think in the mid-20s, you'll be disappointed. If, as I hope, your passion is access to justice, your passion is improving our world economic systems through more effective application of law, then the challenge is, can we maybe do this in new ways? In an internet society rather than a print-based society, what we're suggesting is a whole bundle of new techniques are emerging, and it's for your generation to introduce these to society. Thank you. So we'll entertain questions for professors in Seskine. Many students who are in this classroom and also outside the classroom in other halls are thinking about joining big law. What do you think? How, how long was this dream will be will, will be possible to enforce it? How how long big law will be important and when it will be removed by Axiom and other platforms? What we're not saying is that big law is disappearing overnight. Uh, we, we are taking a very long view of this. And what I would suggest to you, despite everything you said, that if you are able to enter a big law firm and qualify, we would do that. It would be great to have that legal qualification under your belt. I think we can divide big law into two. There will be those who will transform the way they work, there will be those that diversify as the accountants did in the 80s, and they'll thrive as businesses for the foreseeable future. There's those who, ever, however, that will actually respond to what they've said here, what we said here, and say, we can see that, but there's enough, what they would say, price insensitive work to keep us going. We do bet the ranch deals and disputes, and there's enough of that that will keep us going for many years yet. We think this is fallacious. If only for our, the decomposition reason that we're already seeing, certainly in London, the big clients, even in big deals and disputes, are saying expensive big law firm, you do the difficult bits, the more routine work, put out to a regional firm, or we'll give it to a legal process outsource, or, or frankly, automate it. So you want to, if you want to pursue a career in big law, you want one that frankly has the spirit of the major accounting firms, where they look upon the work they do in broader terms. And you'll see a number of law firms, for example, are building consulting practices, risk management practices, or indeed developing systems. In the very long run, in the 30s and 40s, it, we predict that much of that big law work will, will in due course fade too. But I don't think in one's personal planning, indeed in one's strategic planning in a business, one can realistically look more than 10 years ahead. It's greater the experience of working in a big law firm. But what I would say to you is, always be conscious that some of the big law firms will be open to these kinds of developments and others will be very closed. Once you get there, then there's also the opportunity to be one of the agitators, to be one of the innovators, to be one of the disruptors, and to help shape the next generation of that business. Stress again, this is not happening over the next few years, but through the 20s, we're going to see considerable change. Cat videos. Um, what I mean is, like the consumers um, often actually find all the information out there very distracting and a waste of time. I can remember one time me and my brother were in, uh, not in our hometown and we wanted to book a cab. And whereas maybe 15 years ago we would have just picked up the phone book or dialed the operator, we went online, we looked up some taxi firms, then we read a few reviews of them, <laughs> then we like, you know, Googled something else, and then about 15 minutes later we were still sat there and we didn't have a taxi. <laughs> um, so, like, I know that all this stuff's really great if you're very focused, but like, human nature is to watch cat videos on Facebook. <laughs> I think one's got to, we ask you to make a leap, and the leap in the imagination, frankly. Uh, and we call, I'm afraid, uh, uh, the view you've just expressed in our book, in the nicest possible way, technological myopia. People find it very hard to imagine how much better the technology is going to be. And you're absolutely right. It's the case in so many areas, and certainly in law, that a lot of the online systems just now are pretty ropey. 
uh, and they they don't uh, they don't seem intuitive, and they don't help people who don't some kind of legal insight. But if you think of the commercial imperatives, the, the amount of ingenuity, the enthusiasm that there is for making these systems better and better, um, we often talk about Wayne Gretzky, you know, the great ice hockey player, who said he's so great because he skates the work where the puck is going to be rather than where it once was. That's your challenge as individuals in this room, your career. You've got to try and imagine where the puck's going to end up. Uh, it's not going to be the systems of 2015 will look absurd in 2020. We can't say exactly what they're going to look like, but the imaginative leap you've got to make is to assume, and we think it's a fair assumption, you might want to challenge it, that these systems are becoming increasingly capable. They will be, in your term, increasingly focused. And I think, you know, even as I stand here thinking of Uber, that's a tremendous example of a move from how to affect, find a taxi online to within five seconds having, uh, having an isolated one and it's coming to your door within two minutes. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's the point, which is the, the, the information overload, the idea that there's so much out there that it's been, as we heard, every, we think in 2020, every few hours will create <coughs> as much information as we created in the dawn of civilization to 2003 every two hours. How on earth do you navigate through all of this without getting, as you said, distracted? Um, that's an engineering challenge that the people who are designing these new systems are trying to solve, precisely the problem you described. And Uber can be understood as a solution to precisely the problem that you described, uh, which is the internet was not doing a good job of introducing people to taxi drivers. Uber came along with a platform that does that in a in such an efficient way that people are actually uncomfortable. Uh, there is none of the old inefficiency. Uh, it's, it's ruthlessly efficient at getting you a taxi, and people are uncomfortable with that. So I, that, I, think, well, I think we'll see more and more innovations which are responding to exactly the concern that you, you just described. Thank you for being here today. Um, you set out two features. The first is one which will assist professionals and improve efficiency. And the second is displacing professionals. And ultimately, you predict that the latter is going to dominate. If you look at legal startups like Legal Zoom, which you mentioned, or Rocket Lawyer, they both started out with online document production, which would displace professionals. But more recently, they've brought in lawyers on call, which would seem to be going back to assisting professionals. So, how can sort of that shift back be explained? Well, I mean, that's two startups. I think what we know, and I'm really not talking about these two startups, but uh, by and large, the world's rule about startups is they fail. Uh, and so, we cannot really infer anything from two startups. Uh, my guess is the, the startups that will change the legal world by 2025 haven't yet been invented. They might be invented by someone in this room. Uh, we're seeing, I think what's interesting is how they evolve and how they move. Uh, according often to consumer demand, often according to those who are funding them. Uh, their aspirations, both these organisations, I suspect, remain the same. It's just they're seeing there's a, an interim step that needs to be taken while the technology is not yet taking on some of, some of, the, human, some of the human tasks. I'm fascinated by the legal tech startup field because it just seems to be burgeoning. And uh, what we don't yet have at our fingertips is really good analysis of all the various applications. But my guess is some that look great today will struggle and some that we haven't heard of will thrive. If you look at the tax world, so TurboTax is the, kind of the closest, uh, <clears throat> closest kind of comparison to an automated document assembly system in, in, in law. What's so interesting about that is uh, alongside TurboTax, their software is an online community <coughs> called uh, Answer Exchange. And that online community is populated by people who look nothing at all like traditional tax accountants. Um, and why, why is that interesting? Because that's, that's a world in which this new technology is creating a need for human beings. But that need for human beings is being fulfilled by people who look very unlike traditional professionals. Um, so I think it would be a mistake to read to read the book and, and understand what we're saying as um, these technologies are in the media run simply going to cut labour out. You know, that slide where I said in the media run there are all these new roles. Those are the sorts of roles that we see more and more accompanying, um, accompanying these new technologies. To give you another answer to the, that question, they started off thinking there were business model six they're actually currently business model two. They started off seeing all the machine generated. They're seeing actually the more viable one is the paraprofessional model in our view. 
uh, and that's essentially <coughs> what uh, Jumbo Tax is as well. And uh, so, I, I, a different way of expressing Daniel's point here, we're not all about the sixth model. Uh, what we're saying is the different ways, and we'll see an evolution from traditional service to new ways. The eBay, eBay, just like one cup, the eBay dispute resolution system is very interesting. I think it's over 60 million disputes, 54 million of them required no human interaction at all. But there were six million that did require some human input. The point again was that the people who were providing that human input looked nothing like traditional lawyers. They were fulfilling roles and performing tasks that traditional lawyers uh, or that traditional lawyers just simply weren't involved in. Yeah, so the, um, so the, the, the fifty four are, are model six and the, yeah. and the six are model two. Exactly right. right. So st students have to go to class, but uh, can we have another round of applause for Professor? Yeah. Yeah.